So it's my big pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Sandra Di Rocco from KTH in Stockholm, and she will tell us what is the bottleneck degree of an algebraic barrier and how to compute it. Sandra. Thank you very much, Alicia, and uh, thanks for this kind invitation. It's an incredible seminar. Uh, it's fantastic to be able to connect to all over the world. Um, a little bit intimidating, uh, but we'll see. Uh, so today I will speak about, as Alicia said, um, what we call the bottleneck degree of an algebraic variety. And this has a lot to do uh, with the data science and what, what I actually refer to as the algebraic geometry of data. That's the reason for, for the talk. So what do I mean by that? Well, algebraic geometry is about solving polynomial equations. So of course we can have a system of polynomial equations. It could be as easy as this one, just a few variables and two equations. It could be much worse. Typically we'll have many, many more variables uh, and considerably more equations and how do we solve the system or how, how do we understand the geometry of the solutions of the system? Well, what we often do is choose points on the variety. So choose a sampling, a sample of points on the variety. This is what I refer to as data, data points. So this solution might look like this. This is exactly the solution of the system uh, above. And the way we actually look at its shape, it, it, it's by assembling enough points. Of course, the, this assembling has to make sense. And by this, I mean that it, it has to be a choice of points that in a way respects the geometry, the shape. And by this, I mean the topology. So enough points and enough and, and, and dense enough to recover the shape of the variety that we want to that we want to study. So every time we start with uh, an algebraic variety, let's consider this curve, for example, and we choose a number, a finite number of points on the variety, so a, a data set, a sample of points, well we are discretizing the geometry. So we have a discrete information and what we want to, uh, to do is to recover the geometry, again, the shape. One way to do it is to take advantage of the ambient space. So, so by this I mean we could start growing balls around the points, centered at the points. Because now of course we have just a number of points and there are lots of holes, we are not recovering the whole geometry. If you grow balls around the points, well, depending on the radius, of course, we might still be far from recovering the whole shape, but we can increase the radius until we have enough points and enough density. Well, by increasing the radius, we might at some point lose the shape of the variety. So we have to be careful not to take too small radiuses and not to take too large radiuses in order not to, uh, to lose the, the geometry. So this is a discrete way of, of looking at the data on an algebraic variety. We can do this in a continuous way. Instead of looking at data points and instead of looking at balls, we can look at, at tubular neighborhoods around the manifold M. And of course, the diameter or the radius of the tubular neighbors plays this important role of respecting or not the geometry. For very small uh, neighbors, for very small radiuses, we know that the tubular neighborhood is homotopy equivalent to the, to the given manifold. So we are actually respecting the geometry. But of course, if we, if we get to a too large um, um, radius, then something happens. So for example, in this picture, what happened is that we got to a point where we lost the geometry, we introduced singularities, 
And that happened if we, if we consider the shortest um, diameter, that happened exactly when we have two points on the variety having a common normal line. So these two points, we will call bottleneck points, or they are typically called, it's not my definition, they are typically called bottleneck points. This line is typically called a bottleneck line. So that's the way to interpret data on an algebraic variety. Okay, let me now be a little bit more um, rigorous and define the bottlenecks of affine algebraic varieties. And we will be looking at points uh, of, uh, on uh, complex algebraic varieties for obvious reasons. We all know uh, in algebraic geometry, that's what we like to do. So we use the usual orthogonality um, relation between two points in, uh, in CN. We also can define the so-called Euclidean normal space uh, at the given point uh, on the variety by looking at the tangent space at that point, translated to the origin. And then we'll um, actually, we look at all the ambient points Z in CN whose segment or line between Z and X is actually perpendicular to the tangent space Tx zero. So the one translated at the, at the origin. Okay? So these are all the points normal to the original point X. And that's what we typically call the Euclidean normal space. Now let me give you the definition of the bottleneck points or the bottleneck pairs sometimes are called. So these are points on X or pairs of points on, on X, X and Y, whose line, join line, is contained in the intersection between the normal, the Euclidean normal space at X and the Euclidean normal space at Y. In other words, there is a normal line containing both X and Y. Okay, that's exactly what we had in the picture. In the picture, what we were focusing on was the two points having the smallest, in, uh, having the smallest distance between each other because in the picture there were many more pairs of bottleneck points. And this is what is usually the interesting, um, the interesting information for actually recovering a, sam a sample of a variety which is dense enough. So the goal of this talk is basically to count this, to tell you how to count the number of bottlenecks. So the, inter the interesting question from an application point of view is to compute this minimal distance. Compute the distance between the, or, or the smallest distance between a bottleneck pair. Okay? One way of doing it is to compute all possible bottleneck points and then compute the minimal distance. This is actually the way one usually does it. So it is an, a, an interesting question to pose to compute the number of these bottleneck points when, of course, this number is finite. Okay, so let's try to use algebraic geometry to do that. The first thing that we will do is to consider projective algebraic varieties. This is important because we will want to use uh, intersection theory and characteristic classes. And for this, we do need projective algebraic varieties. But eventually, we want to give formulas for both projective varieties and affine varieties. And that will be the goal of, the, of this talk. And these are um, formulas contained in uh, in, in this paper, which is a joint work with uh, David Eklund, which is a researcher at RICE, uh, the Research Institute of Sweden, 
and, and Mandy Benz Feinstein, who is a last year, in fact, graduate student at Berkeley. Okay, so let's now consider a projective algebraic variety, X uh, in Pn. And let me first start by defining the orthogonality condition. Okay? When do we say that two points in Pn are uh, orthogonal? Well, we use the same orthogonality condition as in the affine line. Uh, sorry, in the affine space. And this is defined, you, it's defined using a quadric. So in this particular, um, for this particular condition, when we want to just pairwise uh, multiply the variables and set them to zero, we use uh, the so-called isotropic quadric. Q is given by the sum of all the variables squared um, equal to zero. And the orthogonality condition is defined by setting the sum of the pairwise product of uh, one coordinate and, um, uh, and the partial derivative, derivative of the quadric with respect to the corresponding variable calculated at the point P. This, of course, is equivalent in this particular example with the quadric being the isotropic quadric to the pairwise, uh, to the to coordin coordinate wise product being zero. Of course, one could choose a, a different quadric and have a different uh, orthogonality condition, which would lead to a different geometry. Okay? This is always possible, and that's not the case in the remaining of the talk, but it might be convenient in other occasions. Okay, so that's um, the orthogonality condition that we will use uh, in Pn. So the reciprocal of a given point, um, given by all the points orthogonal to P, uh, as, you, as you all know, this is a hyperplane. Um, the reciprocal to P uh, is, has a codimension one for any uh, linear space V, um, its reciprocal has uh, dimension equal to the codimension minus one. Okay, so the corresponding Euclidean normal space in the uh, projective uh, setting is simply the span between the point X and the reciprocal of the projective tangent space of the variety x at this point small x. Okay? So if the variety has dimension m, the projective tangent space is a linear space of dimension m, at the same dimension as the variety. We take the reciprocal, which has a dimension equal to the codimension minus one, and then we take the joint with the point. Okay? So we get a linear space of dimension equal to the co-dimension. Okay. So what is it that we are uh, doing if we want to use um, a little bit more homological um, reasoning? Okay, let me start uh, by the projective tangent space, Tx. So how do we define the projective tangent space? When we look at the, um, at the map, this is not an injection, is actually a surjection. So I apologize, the first typo in the, in the, in the map, the map from OX1 to OX1 uh, mod by the maximal ideal squared. This is a surjection. Uh, then we look at the um, image of this map. This is a C dimension plus one affine space. We look at the projectivized space. So we get the P dimension X space. And this is what we call the projective tangent space at X, as you all know. These spaces are actually uh, fibers of a 
bundle uh, of a vector bundle called the principal bundle or, or the first jet bundle. I will denote it just by J. So the, the projective tangent space at X is the fiber of the jet bundle. So J at X. So if we consider the map J now, this is this map J is the is fiber-wise the map between the trivial bundle given by the global sections of the hyperplane class OX1 times X. So OX as many times as the ambient projective space. This map subject, actually subjects to the um, to the jet bundle, to the principal bundle. And the kernel of this map is the dual of the normal bundle shifted by one. This map, this map to the right, so this subjective map between vector bundles, actually works like this. In hyperplane, so an element uh, of the global sections of the, of the hyperplane uh, bundle, H and the point X go to zero, so vanish uh, is assigned to zero whenever actually H is a, um, is, a, is a hyperplane which is tangent to the variety X at the small point X, small X. This means that uh, the projective tangent space to the variety X at the small point X is contained in the hyperplane. So, these points HX are exactly the point contained in the kernel. Okay. So now think of dualizing this, uh, this containment. If we dualize um, actually what we have there on the right, instead of HX, we would take the dual of, I, of H or, or the reciprocal. Uh, and, and the reciprocal of X. And we would require that the dual of, of H would be contained, so the dual of H is, the, is a point, will be contained in the reciprocal of the projective tangent space at X. Okay? If you, if, if you remember the definition of the normal space, of the Euclidean normal space, this is exactly what we wanted, right? This is the point contained in the reciprocal of X joined with the given point X. So this uh, uh, Euclidean normal bundle, which was, so the joint of the position point X, uh, this is actually represented by the hyperplane class O1, okay? And the reciprocal of the, uh, of the projective tangent space at X, uh, which, which is the projective eye space of the kernel of this map. So if we, if we take the projective eye space of the, kern, of, the, of the kernel of this map plus the position, so O1, and we consider the fiber at X, that's what we have defined as the, the normal space, the Euclidean normal space. Let me introduce one more very clever we have to where p of is a point okay so this is very much actually related to the projectivized bundle of the kernel of this map. Okay, why am I introducing this co-normal map? I'm, I'm sorry for all, all these technicalities, but that's the only way to define what I have to define. I'm introducing this in order to uh, define um, a, a genericity assumption. And the genericity assumption is something we cannot avoid in this context. And, and for that, let I know this 
something that I shouldn't do, but let's go back to the analogy, okay? Points on the isotropic quadric are, or at least intersection of my variety with points on the, on the isotropic quadric. It's something for which we have to be very careful about. Right. And then this creates, in order to avoid this, I will consider the following. So take less. to saying that the variety of the quadric a well-defined map from the co-normal variety to the Krasmanian of lines in Pn. The map associating to pair of points in Cx, the line spanned by the two points. Okay? So now here this map takes two points on X, of which one is in the normal space of the other one and associates the spanning line in the Grassmannian. Now think for a second at bottleneck points. These are pair of points on X having a common normal line. Okay? So intuitively, actually more than intuitively, one can see that these are the points actually going to the same line via this map F, right? So this, this actually suggests that the bottlenecks are related to what we in algebraic geometry call the double point class of this map F. The double point class is a class in the Chow ring of the co-normal variety CX, right? Parametrizing points having the same image. And let's remember that this double point class also parametrizes tangent direction vanishing via the, the differential of F. So it's a scheme, of course, it's, it's, a little, it's more than just points having the same image. But let's consider it. So DF is the double point class of this map defined by the following formula, right? We take the push forward and pull back, pull back of the push forward of the class of CX minus the n minus one locus of the product of the churn classes, the churn class of the pullback of the tangent of the Grassmannian and the churn class of the tangent of the conormal bundle um, minus one, so the, the inverse. Sandra, can I ask you a question? Of course. Why does the image of F lie in the Grassmannian? This PQ to this inner point. So the Grassmannian, I'm taking the Grassmannian of lines in PN. And the image is the line spanned by PAQ. Ah, that because you have a different PN. notation for the same thing. Okay, so this yeah. is a line. Thank you. Yeah, it's a line. Yeah, sorry. Maybe it's confusing the notation. That's usually what I, what I mean by a line. Thank you. Okay. And let me just um, let me just uh, um, observe that this n minus one. This is because the conormal bundle, uh, sorry, the conormal variety is actually a sub variety of dimension n minus one. Okay, and and then for algebraic geometers, probably the obvious definition. So we define the bottleneck degree of X 
as the degree of this double point class. Okay. Of course, this double point class does not have to be finite. Okay. It might contain more than bottleneck points, but we but four varieties, smooth uh, smooth projective variety in general position, it's a, it's a well defined um, concept, and that's what we call the bottleneck degree of X. Okay. I'm not chatting things in the chat. I I don't know. There was the. Uh, I, I was uh, like, Alisa, if you can uh, interrupt me, if there is some. I, uh, I did interrupt uh, you. No worries. Okay. 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 Great. And okay. There was a, sorry, there was another question whether the variety is connected, and I think what the variety is connected. The varieties that I'm considering are connected. Yes, yes. So, if you are bored and uh, you want to start computing something, well, you could compute this formula for um, plane curves, for generic plane curves. And uh, if you do this, you consider all these classes and uh, pull back to push forwards, uh, what you will get at the end is this formula, right? So the bottleneck degree of a general curve is actually finite and is given by d to the fourth minus 4d squared plus 3d, where d is the degree. Okay. So, again, this math plays uh, a very important, very important role. The double class um, form, uh, sorry, the double point class, the definition of the bottleneck degree. And now we always consider, again, let me remind you, X in general position, meaning that it intersects the isotropic quadric only, only transversally. We are secretly hoping for X to have finitely many bottlenecks. Otherwise, the, de the degree and the connection with the bottleneck points that we were interested in from the beginning, well, wouldn't have much sense. And moreover, we would like this to recover really the bottleneck points, so the points having the same image. We would not like to worry about tangent directions vanishing via the differential. And for this, we might assume, we might uh, actually require that actually the differential of the map F uh, has full rank. Okay? So for convenience, if these three, all three requirements are, are satisfied, then we call a variety in in BN, uh, a BN regular, meaning bottleneck regular, or BN general position. But I, I would like to refer the, to X as BN regular. Now, this, this is not such a big deal. For example, uh, all um, general complete uh, intersection do satisfy these requirements. Okay, so uh, it's it's not a big requirement, but we would like to have this requirement. Why? Because under these assumptions, as you probably would expect, then we can say that uh, a, a variety, which is BN regular, uh, for actually such variety, the bottleneck degree is equal to the number of bottlenecks of X counted with multiplicity. Right? So if we compute the bottleneck degree, we actually have the number of pairs of points, bottlenecks, to the variety. Okay, so that's what we want to compute now in these assumptions. Okay, the degree of this uh, of this scheme. Okay? And for this, we need uh, something that I will be always grateful to Ragni for teaching me. And this is polar polar varieties and polar classes. I've been fascinated by these classes for a long time, and uh, they have inspired a lot of things and a lot of uh, a lot of work. Um, and I I truly believe that they actually capture uh, most of the geometry of of the projective variety. So let's just look at the to start 
polar classes, what are these polar classes? So most of you probably already know, but for example, if we take a conic, so uh, in P2, well, if we pick a, a generic point outside the conic, we can ask about the points on the conic whose tangent lines go through the generic point P. How many points on the variety have a tangent line intersecting the point P? Well, the answer is two. And actually, if we, if, if we look at the line joining these two points, this is exactly the reciprocal line to the generic point P. And these two points on the conic is what we call the first polar class. Right? So the zero dimensional scheme on the conic of degree two. Okay. So with this in mind, let's define uh, polar classes in general. So we start with the projective variety X. Let's consider smooth projective varieties uh, of dimension M over C. Let's fix an index J between zero and the dimension of the variety M. And let's consider a general linear space of this given dimension. So the codimension uh, minus two plus the index J. This defines uh, a class. Which class? Well, if we look at tangent spaces, of, of, um, if we look at the projective tangent spaces at points, these are linear spaces of dimension M, which means that we are expecting the intersection of the projective tangent space with the, with the given general linear space V to be J minus two, okay, generically. Of course, there are exceptions, okay? And we want to collect all the points whose projective tangent space intersect this linear space in an exceptional way, meaning in a, a, in a linear space which has dimension higher than expected, at least J minus one. Okay. This defines a class, which we call the J polar class of X. Okay. Here, uh, for the conic, you know, we, we actually fixed a point, a zero dimensional point, and we looked at all line passing through the point because of the intersecting the, the point in something which was non-empty. Okay, so for a generic linear space, these polar classes are either empty or have uh, pure codimension J. And actually it does not matter which representative, which V we choose. For a generic one, the, this class, all the all this class are actually um, equivalent uh, in, the, in, the chow, uh, in the chow ring of X. Um, and therefore, we talk about um, polar classes of X, okay? Without mentioning B. In a similar way, um, they, these classes have been also, also defined. You probably have seen these classes defined via the Gauss map of, of the variety. This is a map assigned, this is the map assigning to a, a point, uh, in, in general, a smooth point, but we are considering uh, a smooth, uh, smooth variety. It's, um, it's projective tangent space. So, so this is a, it's, it's the map from X to the Grassmannian of PMs in PNs. Um, and, and of course, uh, this is a well-studied map. Uh, it's known and it was proven by Zach that this map is, uh, is finite for, X, for X non degenerate and is actually birational. And one can look at the corresponding Chow um, actually, Chow classes in, in the Grassmannian. So the classes representing this exceptional in intersection with the generic um, uh, linear space uh, V, and then consider the pre-image of these classes, giving a class in the Chow ring of X, and this is exactly the, the polar classes that were defined before. These polar classes are extremely classical, 
I don't know if this extremely classical exists. I mean, the classical it might be considered already extreme, but this is, this is for me, it is extremely uh, classic because they, they, they were even used to define churn classes for, for algebraic varieties, for, for actual manifold uh, in, uh, in general. Um, so actually churn classes were originally defined by um, actually combinations of, uh, um, of polar classes and intersections of polar classes with appropriate uh, powers of the hyperplane class. This, this, um, this equation is, is of course reversible, so this tells you that polar classes are combinations of churn classes and intersection of, of churn classes with appropriate powers of the hyperplane section. So the, the, the polar classes are recovered by the churn classes and vice versa. If X uh, is non-singular, uh, these polar classes are actually characteristic classes and they are churn classes of the jet bundle of the principal part bundle that I defined at, uh, at the beginning. So it can be easily computed uh, this way. If X is singular, so this, this story that I, that I gave and, and the results that I will give are for um, non-singular varieties. This story uh, exists and it's quite well studied, well studied even for uh, singular varieties. And actually Rangni is the expert in, uh, in this. Um, so my expectations is, just, is, is that a lot of what uh, that I will present might be extended to, to certain class of singularities at least. Uh, of course, things are much more, much more complicated. Uh, in order to define everything from the beginning, uh, one needs the so-called Nash modification of the, of, of the variety. And instead of churn class, one has to use churn mother classes and, and so forth. So things get technically much more involved. Okay, so for the for a for a curve um, uh, of degree d, then uh, one easily sees that actually the degree of the zeroth polar class is, is always the degree of the variety, so it's d, and the degree of the first polar class is actually given by twice the degree minus two. So these polar classes, as I said, uh, really govern the geometry. A lot of what I said also has had a dual flavor in, in it. Everything was defined by looking at the reciprocal or, or the dual. Uh, and in fact, uh, so, so th this is the main reason why we, it's, it's, it's very much expected that the, even the bottleneck degree is, will be related and even given by this, uh, these polar classes. So for example, if we look at the dual variety, so the, the variety in the dual projective space parametrizing all the singular hyperplanes at the variety X. Okay, this is the kernel of this, of, of the sequence, is given by the kernel of the sequence that I had a few slides uh, ago. Then one can actually estimate the dimension of this, uh, of the dual variety. Generically, the dimension of the dual variety or the co-dimension of the dual variety in the dual projective space is one, but there are many exceptions. There are exceptions. And uh, the way to estimate the, uh, the dimension is by looking at the index of the, uh, or actually the maximal index of the non-vanishing polar class. So when this maximum index is the maximum possible, which is the dimension of the variety X, M, then the dimension is in fact N minus one. So actually the co-dimension is one. And in this case, actually the degree of the dual variety is given by the degree of the, um, of the polar variety, of the polar class. Okay, uh, polar, so the, these polar classes, and in particular the degree of the polar classes, is something that it's, it's proven to be, to be useful uh, uh, in projective geometry. And actually there is a way of computing uh, these degrees numerically and actually symbolically. Uh, so there are codes uh, 
for people who like codes, both in, uh, uh, in Macaulay 2 and um, uh, symbolic codes in, in Macaulay 2 and in Bertini, so uh, numerical codes. Computing the degree of the polar classes, the degree of the uh, intersection of polar classes, and, and uh, also the degree of intersection of polar classes with a given divisor. Okay, this, this also can be quite useful in, in algebra geometry for, for a number of, uh, of reasons. So just to give you a taste of what you can do if you like coding, and, and again, if this is what you like, from this talk you can do this kind of exercises if you, if you wish. So if you just consider three general forms of degree two in, uh, in six variables, homogeneous, then the, uh, you look at the idea generated by them and you look at the variety uh, defined by this idea. This is a, a complete intersection, that's a surface, uh, a, a complete intersection surface that I call D. Then you can look, for example, you can pick two general degree two elements of the same idea J Okay, look at the variety defined by this idea, and this will be a threefold. This is, will be a quartic threefold X containing D, right? this, this, uh, this hypersurface D. Okay? And then you could ask this code to compute uh, P1 of X, P2 of X, P3 of X, the intersection P1, P2, and the, the intersection of, of uh, certain power with, the, uh, with this divisor D, and you get this degree. The, actually the various degree, 8, 12, 16, 20, 4, 32. And what do you do with it? Well, you, this tells you that the dimension of the dual variety is actually 4, so it is a, a, a hypersurface. The degree of the dual variety is actually 16. If you like, um, if you like computer vision and you, look, uh, you have been looking at the Euclidean distance degree, this is given by the sum of the, of the polar um, actually, the sum of the degrees of the polar classes in this case it's forty, okay? and so forth. I mean, you can have fun and, and do a little bit of this of these computations. Okay, but now let's go back to our theory and to our to our bottleneck count. So we want to count bottlenecks. We have a formula for the degree, so the bottleneck degree. We know that in certain genericity assumptions, this is exactly the number of bottlenecks that we want to count. Intuitively, we do expect this polar variety to, uh, these polar classes to play a major role in this count. And in fact, let me just give it to you. Uh, this is the theorem that I wanted, that I want to, uh, to present. So what is the bottleneck degree of a projective smooth m-dimensional variety in general position. So now just a general, general position. So uh, transversal intersection with the isotropic uh, quadric. Right? This bottleneck degree is given indeed by a polynomial in the polar classes. So a polynomial in the polar classes, so this is certain intersections, well, this will give you the degree of a certain class, okay? Now, there are some indices. Uh, we fix uh, this K, which is between uh, M and this uh, N minus one over two. And then once we fix this K, we vary the index i between zero and k, and then we define this uh, epsilon i, and epsilon i are just sums of degree of certain polar classes determined by this index k. Okay? And then the bottleneck degree is given by the sum of the squares of this epsilon i's, so that's easy to see, and then the degree of a what I, what I actually call BMN, this is the polynomial and it depends only on M and N. And it's a polynomial given by, it's a polynomial in the polar classes. I, I cannot really write it because the way to write it is in the proof of this theorem. And it's, it's easy retraceable. And for example, for certain 
affordable co-dimensions. So if we look at curves in P2, then we get the same formula as you should have gotten by now, uh, if you did this exercise, d squared, d fourth minus four d squared plus three d. If we look at curves in P3, then, then we have a quite uh, nice polynomial in the degree and the genus of the curve, since both um, P0 and P1 are expressible in the degree and the genus of the, of the curve. If we look at surfaces in P5, things start getting a little bit complicated, more complicated, but still you can explicitly write it down. These are this epsilon square, epsilon one square, epsilon, epsilon zero is the, is the sum of all the degrees of the, of the polar classes, as you know, is the Euclidean distance degree. So this y0 square is the Euclidean distance degree squared, if you know what I'm talking about. And then the rest is, is easily computable and so forth, okay? Of course, you, you will have intersection with the hyperplane class since this has to be a, a well, in a, 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 uh, sorry, a class in the appropriate uh, dimension. I don't want to say, unfortunately, it's, it's a bit technical, but it's very easy at the same time. I mean, it, it looks scary, but it's, the proof is the formula. So the proof, as you, is, if you remember, we had to f compute the degree of the double point class of this F. We have to use the generators of the corresponding Chow ring.